Hello everyone and welcome to today's Sustainable Success While Mindfulness Matters webinar brought to you by your Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I'm Drew Webb, Assistant Director of Student Alumni Engagement and I'm so glad you could all join us today. Um, this webinar is just one of many programs that the Alumni Association provides to support your professional development, so be sure to familiarize yourself with some of the additional resources, including other archived webinars at vuconnect.com slash career. Today's webinar will last around 45 minutes with time at the end for questions. And please feel free to type in your questions as you have them into the question box that's on your screen. And we'll make sure that these are addressed before time is up today. Uh, we are recording the webinar and we'll post it on the Expert Advice webpage in BU Connect and we'll also share the recording and slides with you via a follow-up email. Uh, we are excited to host a webinar specifically for Vanderbilt alumni today. Uh, we have about 40 of you joining us as well as a few alumni and we're fortunate to have a Vanderbilt alumna, um, Lisa Aberson, presenting to us today. Lisa is an executive coach, speaker, entrepreneur, and co-founder co of Mindfulness-Based Achievement, who has dedicated her life to inspiring women to achieve success in an entirely new way. Her corporate and individual programs teach high-achieving women how to lean in without burning out. Her MBA curriculum has been taught to hundreds of women, as well as at Google, Cisco, the Stanford Graduate School of Business, LinkedIn, YouTube, Salesforce, Goldman Sachs, Bain and & Company, and many others. Lisa graduated from Vanderbilt in 2005 with a bachelor's in political science and has served as president and a steering committee member of the Vanderbilt alumni chapter in San Francisco. And a special shout out to everyone joining us uh, on the call from San Francisco today. And uh, now I'm excited to turn over the presentation to Lisa. Thanks so much, Drew, um, and thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining this webinar. Um, and really, you know, thank you for making time for you and for uh, investing in yourself. It's you know, it's really truly courageous to start to ask yourself, you know, what do I want, and you know, what does success really mean to me? Um, and starting to get really curious about that answer. Um, and it's even more courageous, I think, to do something completely uh, radical that I'll talk a little bit about today is to stop treating being, uh, you know, busy as a sign of prestige. I mean, how many of you, when someone, you ask someone how they were doing just this morning on your, you know, way into the office or your way to, you know, drop kids at school, they said, I'm so busy or crazy busy and, you know, people are, Kind of flaunting how busy and overextended and overwhelmed they are as really a badge of honor or sign that they're important. So, you know, it's a lot easier to blame things on being busy, um, you know, especially when that kind of validates our self of importance. So, I just want to um, give you a heads up about that and know that it is truly courageous what we're doing here today talking about creating, you know, sustainable success, but really success on your terms that works for you. And that's going to mean doing things a little bit differently than the people around you. You know, we're in a, a culture where, you know, yeah, busy uh, and maxed out is seen as a sign of prestige. And I'm going to ask you to get curious about that. And if that works for you, or if you're interested in maybe making some changes or thinking about things differently. Um, so uh, I definitely know the the busy, overwhelmed track. Um, I oops. I you know know this firsthand. I was running marketing at a technology startup. I wasn't even thirty yet, and I was sitting in on board meetings. I was one of the executives at the company, and you know on paper everything looked great, except that. I was commuting three hours a day and I wasn't making time for myself and at night I would lay my head on my pillow and all I could think about was this endless list of to-dos that I hadn't got to and I was really fueled by this stress and anxiety and just desire to you know keep achieving and keep pushing towards success um, and it really it ended up wearing on me and I kind of you know, on these long commutes, you know, three hours from San Francisco down to Mountain View each um, day there and back. And I kept thinking, you know, 
there's got to be something else or you know what am I doing this all for and at first um, those curiosities were interesting but then they actually I realized I needed some more quiet and some more peace of mind and for me one of the the tools that I went for first was uh, meditation and mindfulness because I did a good old Google search for you know stress reduction techniques I was thinking you know oh, my stress is like pretty high and this probably isn't good to be all the time this stressed out so I did the good old Google search and luckily for me I found all of this research about uh, meditation and mindfulness and how much uh, it could help and so for me reading the research really it got me over the edge and got me interested in practicing but here I was saying okay I'm gonna give that woo-woo stuff a try because the research said it's gonna work but I'm still in my job I'm still commuting three hours a day I'm not creating any more time in my life and so I said I'm gonna give this a shot but I all I have is four minutes a day but I'm gonna do it every single day for four minutes no matter what so rain or shine I am going to do my four minutes of meditation and I found you know for me as an overachiever this is quite laughable to think like oh, I'm gonna to commit to four minutes you know yay me <laughs> but actually that small commitment was it ended up getting me hooked on really the benefits of um, meditation and mindfulness because I found that this little bit of peace and quiet in my day was so different from the rest of my jam-packed schedules you know waking up looking at my phone checking emails responding to emails just being on call all day long it was so different that it actually made a really big impact um, in my life and I of course um, you know went deeper into the study of meditation mindfulness ended up going on a 10-day uh, silent meditation retreat down in Southern California near Joshua Tree and National Park where we meditated from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night so um, that was that was quite intense my friends joked that I had ran a marathon and then I decided to go on the marathon of meditation retreats <laughs> which was very true um, but through this process I realized what I was really passionate about was bringing this these tools for meditation and mindfulness but also so many of the tools I learned um, as I was training to be an executive coach bringing these back to busy and overwhelmed workers um, especially women like myself who are very driven and they still you know want to go after big bold and ambitious dreams but they don't want to do it at the expense of everything else so how can you balance this um, desire to achieve and to really push yourself but not do it in a way that's harmful or only fueled by stress so you know sometimes we need to make big changes for me that ended up being you know an entire career change but sometimes small tweaks are all we really need to make a big difference um, and that's again why I'm just like so passionate about helping people find their purpose and create you know a more meaningful life for themselves so I do this with coaching one-on-one -on -one, also through my online um, MBA program mindfulness based achievement um, and within corporations um, as Drew mentioned and many people ask me you know, how can you be so you know joyful and positive all the time and I just um, I love this question because I really am that way but it's definitely not because I haven't been knocked down or pushed to my limits like trust me on this one so I certainly have you know my bad days where I feel like there's never enough time or money or energy or I haven't gotten enough sleep you know or when I send a passive-aggressive email or I can snap at my adorable three-year-old daughter because I just don't want to read you know the Thomas the Train book for the 15th time in a row the exact same book and you know I'm only human and um, I've certainly had you know rough and challenging times in my life you can watch my TEDx talk to hear about uh, one such rock bottom moment if you're curious um, but I do however have really a deep willingness to look at any place in my life where I'm creating the opposite of what I want and I practice all the tools that I teach so that I can you know in some days better than others 
take whatever's given to me as a growth opportunity. But it's really, it's an everyday commitment. And I just tell you this because it's, um, it, takes, it takes hard work and it takes looking at things and being willing to challenge the way you're doing them. But I know that everyone here on this call and listening to the recording can do that too. Um, so through these you know, mindfulness practices and all the tools I teach, I feel like I've put my brain on an intense training regimen. I like to think of meditation as you know, bicep curls for the brain. And most of the time, you know, my brain cooperates, but <laughs> sometimes it, it still wanders frequently. So, um, and here's a big thing I want you to know, and maybe even write down, because I think it's really important, is that our brain wasn't designed for our happiness. It was actually designed for our survival, and it evolved over time that way to really help us survive and that's why I think meditation and mindfulness is and this kind of mental training is more important than ever because we have to go against the natural tendencies of our brains but because of that we can you know be intentional we can put practices in place to really foster this well-being and happiness and they even did some of the studies I was talking about about meditation and mindfulness is they found in the last um, you know, 10 years or so something called neuroplasticity, which means in our brains, actually what we think and do and pay attention to, it actually starts to change the structure and the function of our brains. In as little as eight weeks of mindfulness training, you can start to increase the gray matter in your brain. So you actually are changing the structures within your brain. Which I, it just blew my mind to read this because your gray matter, that has to do with your, your learning um, and your memory. I mean, so this is really important and you're actually growing this um, important matter. And you can also reduce the size of the amygdala, like actually reduce this structure in your brain and your amygdala, if you remember, uh, from science class, or if you were at pre-med at Vandy, that um, the amygdala is what controls our stress response, so it controls our fight or flight response, and you can actually shrink that so that you become less responsive and reactive over time to the stresses around you. So this is very intriguing for me, and this is some of the research that really um, put me over the edge and getting curious about this stuff. So, um, you know, my hope is that you walk away from this webinar with some new ahas and also some practical tools. We're going to do an exercise that you can, was emailed to you, but is also um, in the chat box. Drew's posted it there. So um, go ahead and grab that handout if you haven't already um, so that you have it. Um, but we're not going to use it right now. We're actually, I'm going to kick off and start with a really short mindfulness practice so you can get a little taste of what I'm talking about. So I invite you to uh, just close your eyes and uncross your legs if they're crossed and place your feet firmly on the ground. And just take a deep breath in through your nose and then exhale through your mouth. And just begin to tune in to the sensations of breathing wherever they're strongest. You might notice cool air coming in through your nostrils. You might notice your chest gently expanding with each inhale. You might relax your belly and notice how it gently expands with each inhale. I'm just trying to feel how it feels to breathe right now. 
And just find that anchor point in your body, either your nose or your chest or your belly, wherever it's strongest. And now I want you to picture yourself inhaling calm, peaceful energy. And then exhaling any stress or tension. Inhaling calm, peaceful energy. And then exhaling any stress or tension. Inhaling peace and exhaling tension. And just notice where your mind is now without judging it. Just your mind has wandered. Simply bring your attention back to your breath. Feeling the sensations of breathing inside your body. And if you're having trouble finding the sensations of breathing, you could put your hand on your chest or on your belly so that you feel the gentle movements. Beginning to tune in more to the sensations of breathing. Inhaling calm, peaceful energy and exhaling any stress or tension. And just notice where your mind is now. And if it's wandered, bring your attention back to the breath. Inhaling peace and exhaling any tension. Now bring your attention to any sounds in the room. Feel the sensation of your feet on the floor or in your shoes. You can wiggle your fingers and toes and when you're ready you can gently open your eyes. Thank you all for going through that short practice with me. That was just a few minutes. And I love, um, you know, doing these short practices. I find they're great. It's a great way to, you know, recenter yourself. And um, it's also a fun way to sort of recalibrate time because time can, for some of you might have said, that felt like, you know, 10 minutes or maybe it even felt like 20 minutes even though it was just a few minutes. So sometimes even when we're busiest and we feel like there's not enough time to slow down um, and take a few deep breaths, it can actually really help us because it starts, um, it recalibrates time for us and helps us, you know, be more in the moment. So, uh, you know, Mindfulness can surely, you know, help you feel relaxed and less stressed. But I also want to tell a story because I think um, it's so much more than that. And this story was told by one of my mentors, um, Jack Cornfield, who teaches um, and runs a center called Spirit Rock up in Marin. And there was um, a, a vet. Um, a U.S. vet who had come to um, a mindfulness training class. He was scheduled to do an eight-week mindfulness course, and he was told that he should do this by his superiors because he had a little bit of an anger management issue. He had found that you know he was very into like you know following the rules, things being how they sh you know should be orderly and the way that he expected people should follow rules and 
If they didn't, he found himself getting really angry very, very quickly. So he was sent to a mindfulness uh, training, an eight-week program, and he was about six weeks through when he was going home one evening and he stopped at the grocery his store to get some food for his dinner. And he noticed when you know he was waiting in line at the grocery store that you know this woman in front of him she only had a single can of soup and he was in the regular line and his first thought was you know this woman is breaking the rules she's you know she should be in the express line she only has a single can of soup now this is wasting my time like people should just follow the rules and he saw, he saw that and he felt like oh, I'm getting really angry and he could tell his blood was starting to boil and he had really been kind of riled up by seeing this and, and really started to get irritated. And you know, he was hungry, he just wanted to get home and this woman just had a single can of soup in front of him. And then, you know, he noticed himself getting really worked up and, um, you know, getting frustrated and then he sees that, you know, the woman actually has a baby with her and then she's handing the baby to the cashier. Um, to, and he's just like, oh my gosh, I'm losing my mind. This woman's like, you know, gooing and gawing over the baby and then like giving the baby to the cashier and he's like, I'm never going to get out of here. This is just like my worst day. But then he remembers what he learned in his mindfulness training and he decides he's going to take two deep breaths and he just takes two deep breaths. And then he opens his eyes and he just sees that the woman and the baby have checked out and he's a little bit more calmer after just taking those two deep breaths. So he says to the cashier, you know, hey, um, that baby was pretty cute. And the woman said, oh, you think? She said, that was my son. My husband was called away to the war and my mom brings him in every day so that I can see him. And she said, you know, she just, the vet started crying there, right in the grocery store, just seeing how often, you know, in our lives we are just rushing around and, you know, making assumptions and moving so quickly that we're really missing out on these connection, opportunity for like connection and love and belonging. These things that we crave so deeply but can be really elusive when we're stuck in this busy trap and running from here to there. So I love that story because I feel like it really brings together why this is so important. You know, yes, it can, it can help you reduce your stress, but it can also bring so much more into your life. So I hope that you get to experience that. So, I want you to think about now, what do you need in order to get the most out of this session together? What do you need to give yourself permission um, to do? Sometimes that's the very mo the most important and very first step is just giving ourselves permission. So maybe you need to give yourself permission to try something new and feel uncomfortable. Or maybe you need to give yourself permission to be honest and look at issues that you know keep coming up and look at them from a new perspective. Or sometimes we need to just give ourselves permission to not know, to say, I'm gonna stay curious, I'm gonna stay open. So whatever it is, I want you to give yourself permission. What do you need right now in order to get the most out of this session together? And just write it down. You don't have to share this with anyone, it's just for you. You can write it on a piece of scrap of paper or on the handout. But just write it down and give yourself permission for that. So I want to shift now into an exercise I call success on your terms or sourcing your beliefs on success. That's the first step. And what I'm going to want you to do, this is the first page of the handout, is to just go with your gut on this. There's no right or wrong answers and you don't have to share this with anyone. So I want you to start off by whatever comes to mind when you says, say success to my family 
or parent or parents is. And just write, you know, write down whatever comes to you. If it's, you know, being a doctor or making a certain income or going to a top school, what, what is success to your family? And just take a moment, I'm going to give you about a minute to come up with whatever comes to mind and write, actually write this down on the first page of the handout. And again, go with your gut. There's no uh, right or wrong answers. All right, and then I want you to move forward and also say um, whatever comes to mind when you say success to my peers or friends is. And then you can also do this, the third portion is success to me is. So I'm going to give you a minute to just fill out uh, the first and second page and you're trying to just uncover whatever your, your subconscious beliefs, whatever is, you know, the gut response that comes up for this. So just start filling out the form. I'll give you another 30 seconds for this. Okay, so hopefully you have something written down for uh, each of the three categories. And so in terms of kind of creating success on our own terms, it's really important to get this out in the open. And basically these are the beliefs that are currently shaping our views on success. Whether we like it or not, this is what's coming up um, when we think about the word success and what it means to us. So. That's why we do this exercise first, where we talk about, you know, what are the subconscious beliefs so that we can make them conscious and then hopefully uh, shift them and change them so that you end up creating a new definition of success for yourself. So the next thing I want you to do is really get clear on your values. And so you can go to page three of the exercise and I want you to circle your top 10 values approximately. You can anywhere between 5 and 12 or so. It's perfect. Um, so circle what resonates with you and I'll give you a couple of minutes to do this so that you have plenty of time. And again there's no right or wrong answers. It's whatever you feel. They can either be values that you hold dear today or values that you aspire to or areas that you want to incorporate more into your life.
All right, and maybe 30 more seconds. I'll give you another minute for your values. So 30 more seconds on picking your top 10 values, approximately. Anything that pops out from this list of values. All right. And you can always do this again um, and spend some more time on it after this webinar um, since you have access to this handout. And one thing I wanted to mention about uh, the definitions of success, um, just as a, a side note, um, you know, since I've taught this many times, some things that come up um, somewhere along the way from a majority of people, especially um, you know, high achieving people that go to great schools uh, like Vanderbilt is that some somewhere, whether it's success to them or their peers or their family or just society, is that you know success is equivalent you know to money, power, and prestige. So that's usually those are things that pop up um, that might or might not have popped up for you, but can be pretty prevalent. Um, in terms of messages we're getting, you know, from from the people around us and from society in general. So now I'd like you to switch to page four of the handout, step three, which is redefining success. And I want you to write down an, a new and re revised version of success that's really based on your values. And so fill out that sentence. Success to me is, you know, it could be as simple as success to me is living a life in accordance to my values. Or you could call out some specific values um, that you want to, you know, incorporate. You know, success to me is embodying the values of X, Y, and Z. Or really think about, um, you can look at, the current definition you had on it was the second page and then write down an updated definition you know based on these values and any insight you've had I'm going to give you like a minute here to write down your new definition of success. And again, there's no right or wrong answers, and we're doing this pretty quickly for the sake of the webinar. So um, just get a rough draft in there, and you can always tweak it um, after this session. So I mentioned earlier when I was telling a little bit about, um, you know, where I've been in my career and how I, I landed here today. You know, I've certainly, you know, identify with being, you know, driven and sort of a type A overachiever. If you couldn't, <laughs> if you couldn't tell, uh, that's me. And there's some great you know benefits from being you know very driven and focused and being able to achieve your goals but um, with that kind of you know power and focus and ability to really tune out distractions and just get stuff done and and focus 
it's even more important than ever to be pointing your compass towards something that's meaningful and fulfilling to you because I you know no doubt about it if you were you know someone who you know got into Vanderbilt went to Vanderbilt and you know have been a, you know achieving success along your career and you're interested in this topic it's um, I believe that you just like me know how to get things done and know how to achieve goals that you set out for yourself so the it's really more important than ever that you are pushing after the right goals because you know I've been there sacrificing kind of my free time my sanity all in the name of success only to be left wondering like is this really worth it and um, I know you know success without fulfillment I call that you know the ultimate failure um, and I want to save you from that kind of disappointment of kind of getting this to a height of success and then realizing like oh this wasn't even that great or it certainly wasn't worth the sacrifices so these exercises the point of it is to really help you check in and make sure that you're moving in the right direction before you know you reach the pinnacle of you know success or you've sacrificed too much and and you feel like that trade-off wasn't work, worth it so the next thing I want you to do is step four it's on page four of the handout is to really start taking action um, you know as it says on the slide transformation is really it's 20 percent insight and I certainly hope you've had some you know ahas on this webinar and some things that have popped in your brain is interesting but really transformation is 80 percent the actions you take so you can have all the insight in the world but if you're not taking action uh, you're not going to move forward and actually change so what I want you to write down is something you can do this week no matter how small towards your version of success so whatever it is you know create the time and space to make it happen and so write down with an actual deadline like by Sunday night at 9 p.m. I'm going to do X Y and Z so write that down this action step so that you can start to move forward towards really transforming your version of success. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do this. So I think one of the most important things here in terms of creating sustainable success is to have really the tools and the resources to you know manage your stress and you know avoid burnout avoid overdoing it but also to be able to make sure you know as I said that your compass is pointing in the right direction and that you're actually moving towards success that's meaningful and important to you so it's kind of two parts it's having the tools and the resources so that you don't burn out and overwhelm yourself along the process but then it's also making sure that uh, that goal and your definition of success is something that that is actually deeply fulfilling and meaningful and not just something that you picked up along the way from your parents or your peers or from just what society is saying is um, their definition of success so you know as I'm talking here about you know being action oriented and really how you can move forward I invite you to really you know make a commitment whether it's you know buying a book or starting a mindfulness practice or 
you know, booking a session with a coach or joining a program or, um, you know, getting your company to sponsor mindfulness training. Just do something that whatever it is that is calling to you, um, you know, or watch it, you know, a TED Talk or just whatever it feels like coming up and inspiring you to move forward, you know, take action on that. Um, I think one of the simplest ways to start creating profound change in your life is to make a commitment um, to just four minutes a day and you can do this as you know a mindfulness practice or you can do um, a couple of other exercises that I'm going to tell you about but be willing to commit to something so um, and I created this little earworm I commit to four minutes or more a day to get what I want in an easier way because it really stuck in my head and then felt like it was easy to do. So one thing I recommend is doing a success ritual. I think this is the easiest way to keep those four minutes really sacred. And what this involves is you know, putting a glass of water by your bedside table. Um, so that, and the point of that water is to actually put that water where you probably used to have your phone. I, I'm sure if I was in a room with all of you and I was saying, how many of you sleep with your phone beside you? Probably 80 or 90% would raise their hand. Say it's the first, last thing you look at before you go to bed or the first thing you look at in the morning. So I invite you to just, you know, for the next 30 days, experiment with this success ritual. Experiment with four minutes a day and just see how it works for you. You know, again, this, the 20% insight and the aha is, the action is what really counts, but you need to try this stuff on for size and see how it works for you and see if you experience change. Um, so I invite you to that challenge to just give it a try. So, you know, and I teach this stuff and trust me, I'm, I am not, <laughs> I do not have enough willpower to <laughs> stay away from my phone if it's in my room. I, uh, so I'm not at all, um, <laughs> I am in the same exact boat with you, and I actually have to charge my phone in the kitchen so that I'm not tempted to look at it in the morning. So I put my phone in the kitchen, but you should charge it outside of your room. Put a glass of water by your bedside so that the first thing in the morning you see that water, and it reminds you to do your success ritual. So it's a little you know, mental trigger. You see it, and then you do your success ritual, which involves drinking um, you know, some of the water, and then doing one of these suggested four minute activities. So you can spend four minutes journaling. You can write down three things you appreciate. You can try meditating for four minutes or more. Um, we have a free meditation challenge on our website where we send you an email with a, a guided meditation led by me or my business partner Vanessa, so you can enjoy that. Um, I think it's the easiest way and the way that I learned to meditate was listening to guided meditations because if I just sat quietly by myself, my mind would wander the whole time. So it's helpful to have prompts telling you, hey, you know, bring your attention back to the moment, um, come back. Uh, and there's also just guided meditations on the website, www.livingmba.com. Uh, and if you want to join that 30-day free challenge, you can text this number, text MBA 30-day to 44222, um, and you just enter your email address, and then you can start that 30-day challenge. Um, we've had, like, oh gosh, over maybe 15,000 people who have taken this challenge and said, you know, I've tried to meditate for years, but this finally got me <laughs> to start a habit. So it, it works really well and I hope that you enjoy it too. Uh, so wrapping up again I just really invite you to take action on something that you've learned here today and make a small change and be committed to it um, and just see how it works for you and kind of be your own guinea pig and experiment and just notice do you feel you know when you do the success ritual do you feel calmer uh, you know during the day, do you feel like you're more able to handle the stress and the challenges that come towards you? Um, but just check it out for yourself. Um, don't just believe me. Um, and if for if you missed anything or you want to 
go over this again. Drew's going to send an email by the end of the week with a recording of this webinar, so you have that as a resource, um, the handout. There'll also be a link to the 30-day challenge. Um, we have a burnout prevention guide It's that shows the 13 um, reasons you might be on the edge of burnout and what to do about it. So that's like a 40-page document with tons of resources and tools. So there'll be a link to that in the email that Drew sends. We also have a guide on you know how to meditate, 10 tips to know before you start. Um, and also I'll include um, a link for our full online MBA program, which is, um, it's mostly for women, but we have a few good men in it too. Um, and I'll include a $400 off coupon in that email from Drew. So hopefully you have a ton of resources and this has been valuable for you. Um, and I can't wait to answer some of your questions. So um, Drew, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If you can give Great. me some of the questions, that'd be awesome. Well. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And uh, if anyone has questions, go ahead and feel free to type those into the question um, box. Um, it looks like we just had one come in. Um, is your MBA curriculum available to those who are not in the corporate sector? Yes. Ab yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, yeah, we had, you know, stay-at-home moms take the MBA program. We've had, uh, yeah, people in nonprofits, teachers, um, even um, some people in their retirement have enjoyed the MBA curriculum since they've kind of changed, um, you know, when change is coming up, it's a great program to take. So thank you for that question. Hey, and uh, here's another one that just came in. Uh, someone really loved the van veteran anecdote that you um, included uh, and asked if you know of any resources uh, for the use of mindfulness for PTSD treatment. You know, I don't have any specific ones off the top of my head, but if you email um, info at livingmba.com, that'll come in to me, and um, I can see what I can find in my community, but I know that there's been a lot of good work um, with mindfulness and helping with vets. Um, so I'll see if I can dig up anything, but nothing comes to the top of my head on that. Okay, here's another one. Um, how do you balance the long, never-ending to-do list, even keeping up with what should be on that list? Yeah, oh, that's a great, great question, and uh, I, <laughs> I feel you for it, being someone who for so many years used my to-do list as kind of a way to punish myself and to feel like I was never accomplishing enough. Um, and a funny story about that in terms of when you're once a planner and a to-do list person, always that way. So I was realizing, um, you know, when I was on that 10-day meditation retreat I was telling you all about, I was on day three of the meditation retreat, and I realized that I had been writing a to-do list that said, you know, sleep, meditate, eat, and I was checking the box. I mean, that was all I had to do the entire 10 days was – you know, sleep and meditate and eat, and I still felt compelled to write a to-do list and put those three things on it just so I could check the box at the end of the day. So anyway, I say that um, with much love, saying that I'm a to-do list person and this is a problem <laughs> for me that I've been unworking for a while. Um, one thing that's really helped me is to do something that I call a mind dump, and that's where I just make this crazy long list, it could even be pages long of like everything under the sun that I can think about doing or need to do and then I have it on paper and that helps to keep it out of my head and from stressing me out and then what I do um, is find the two to three most important things that I need to do each day kind of so I have that brain dump but that's not actually my to-do list. That's just like keeping a record. Um, and actually, um, and Drew, I'll add this to the email. Um, we have a weekly planning guide, and that has a really effective way to start better planning your week and how to kind of pare down your to-do list. So I'll send that weekly planning guide um, to Drew so that you have that. There's a little video and a resource that I found to be really helpful to keep me on track. 
Oh, great. Um, do you ha do you recommend any tools for communicating with colleagues and employees in the workplace that build upon mindfulness practices? Yeah, I mean, I I think the best way that you can incorporate this is to really you know lead by example and um, just you know in some companies that I work with they have people um, just listen to one of our guided meditations in a conference room you know once a week and then have a short discussion after so just inviting some others into colleagues into your world with you and say hey you know do you want to try or try doing this meditation challenge with me and let's talk about just ask each other each day did you do it um, so kind of inviting people in I also know you know at Google for example they do what they call a G pause at the beginning of most of their meetings which is just one minute um, you know of silence where people can meditate or they can just you know breathe and just sit there but it actually really helps the meetings be more productive when you take a short pause before you start to just like let you know whatever was going on before be over and then start something new so kind of creative ways to you know bring mindfulness practices into your meetings or um, you know bring in a speaker or facilitator to do a corporate workshop um, you know we love doing those and that seems to get people kind of talking the same language so that it's not um, it's not foreign when you bring it up okay and we have one more um, do you have any tips for staying focused in an off open office cube farm um, I find that uh, this yeah. person said they find it very <laughs> distracting and hard to be productive, which I think several of us are probably in that situation. So, Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it is very hard to, to stay focused in a, an open environment when you have people, you know, walking around you and dropping in all the time. Um, one tool that we teach in a lot of our corporate workshops that's really popular is, um, it's actually been fun, people we've gone back like a year later and they're like I'm still doing my power hour and um, the power hour is not a it's not a drinking game sorry to disappoint you uh, it's a productivity <laughs> tool <laughs> but um, what, it, what a power hour involves is uh, and usually in your open office space this would require like booking a conference room or you know going to a coffee shop and getting out of the office um, and the key here is just to tell people ahead of time hey I'm going to be doing my power hour, I'm working on these most important tasks, um, so I'm going to be out of pocket for the next 80 minutes. But what you do in this power hour is you, know, you put away all of the distractions, the things that you don't need, and actually you know, go and blockade yourself in a conference room or you know, some companies we've taught at actually give their employees signs that say I'm doing a power hour and they put it on their queue so people don't interrupt them. But Basically, you pick your first, you know, two to three top most important things that you'd like to get done, and then you f do that first for 20 minutes, and then you take a two-minute break, you know, something unrelated to your work, you know, go get a glass of water, or just take a quick, um, you know, walk around or stand up and stretch, and then do 20 more minutes of focus work and then a two-minute break and then 20 more minutes of work and then a 10-minute break. And this has been shown to be like the absolute best way to work, to work in pulses of this 20 minute increment because just like our brain, when we sleep, our brain goes through cycles of REM sleep. Our brain pulses like that also during the day. And 20 minutes is the optimal time where we can really focus and stay focused. And then we give ourselves a break and then we engage again and focus. So doing these three 20 minute intervals with short breaks is really effective and I've had people say when I did just one power hour in the morning I accomplished more than I did usually for my entire day because we can get interrupted so often which you guys you know clearly all know but one interruption sometimes it takes us if we have you know a minute of an interruption someone comes and chats with us it can take 10 times the length of the interruption so it could take 10 minutes to refocus and get back to working at the task at hand so it's incredibly disruptive to be interrupted with you know emails and notifications and your phone and text um, so creating that 
sacred environment, even if it's only one hour of your day, I think will make a really big impact. Great. Well, thank you again, Lisa, for all the, the strategies you taught us today about mindfulness, and thank you, alumni, for joining. Um, and again, just be looking forward to that uh, follow-up email that I'll, I'll hopefully get to you in the next couple of days. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.